Rich, I don't know if you knew what I was preaching on tonight, but I'm preaching on Christ dwelling in the heart. And uh, I was thinking while we were singing that song, what do I know of Christ actually dwelling in my heart? Now that is a, an amazing concept. Uh, if you could call it a concept, that's probably not a very good word, but I'm kind of at a loss for words at trying to speak of Christ dwelling in the heart. And I request that you pray for me as I attempt to preach this message. I do not want to darken counsel with words without knowledge. And no doubt there's much been much darkening counsel with words without knowledge regarding this truth of Christ dwelling in the heart. What does it mean, Christ dwelling in the heart? I want to know if he dwells in my heart. Paul had been speaking of being strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. And we considered that last week, this inner man. This is the new man. Every believer has two natures, the new man and the old man. The man we were born with in the physical birth, that's the first man. That's the old man. And the second man is the man we're born with in the new birth, regenerated by God the Holy Spirit, given a life that was not there before. The new man in Christ Jesus, the inner man. Now here's what it looks like as the spirit strengthens with might the inner man. Christ dwells, resides, lives in the heart by faith. We've missed the meaning if we don't Get this thing, he dwells in the heart by faith. Now, let me give you some scriptures. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you have, and I have no hope unless Christ dwells within us and causes us to believe and causes us to repent and causes us to continue in the faith. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that there is this scripture in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. You know, it's not enough for him to reveal himself to me. I'll lose it. I must have him to reveal himself in me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Like we were just singing. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live off his faith. Galatians chapter 4, verses 19 through 21, Paul said, My little children, speaking to the Galatians, My little children, to whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. He said, I stand in doubt of you. Now that's strong language, isn't it? He said, I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Why did he stand in doubt of them? Because they were showing a tendency to want to be under the law. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law. Don't you hear it? All it does is condemn. It can't do anything else but that. Expose and condemn. And because these Galatians seem to have some kind of desire to be under the law, he said, I stand in doubt of you. He says, the first of the epistle. I marvel 
that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ undo another gospel. Job said, the root of the matter is in me. And if I'm a believer, the root of the matter is in me. Not simply outside of me doing things for me, but in me. And let me say this to all who he dwells in your heart by faith, and this is every believer. He dwells in the heart of every believer without exception. If he dwells in your heart, there's a reason. If he's in you, it's because you're in him. Now that's a simple concept, but it's the truth. If he's in you, there's one singular reason for that. You're in him. In him by an eternal, vital, living union. You're one with him. In him by election, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In him, because that's where God has put you. Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Because you're in him, he's in you. That is the reason. If you have faith, it's because he's in you. It's because you're in him and he's in you. Now, in our text, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, what about the description the Bible gives of the human heart? The heart we were born with. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who could know it? The wise man said in Proverbs uh, 28, 26, He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. Now what about that? What about God's testimony of the heart in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that's the state of my heart by nature. That's the state of your heart by nature. And if you don't see that, God's never done anything for you. That's the only reason you wouldn't see that. The Lord hadn't done anything for you. Because if he's done anything for you, you're going to see this is the truth regarding you. Now, does Christ dwell in that heart? The answer is no. He doesn't dwell in that heart. He dwells in the heart that he's given. Remember when the Lord talked about blessed are the pure in heart? That's the new heart that he has given. Create in me, David said, a clean heart. Um, the Lord gives us a, a you know, he said in, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, a heart that you didn't have before. And this is the heart that he dwells in. And the Lord gives us a very simple parable to make this very plain to us. He said, you don't take new wine and put it into old wineskins. Old wineskins are dried up. They're not supple. Uh, the fermentation of the wine would bust them. You'd lose the wine. You'd lose the wineskins. You don't put new wine into old wineskins. You put new wine into new wineskins. The Lord doesn't put the oil of his spirit. He doesn't dwell. He doesn't give his grace and make it to live in the old heart. The Lord's not going to live in that heart. I remember one time my little sister said this to me. She said the preacher was saying, give Jesus your heart. Give Jesus your heart. And I thought, what would he want with it? True. What would he want with that old heart of yours? You You'd be much better off, I'd be much better off asking him for a new heart. Not giving him my old heart. That's no good. Lord, give me a new heart. 
And the Lord gives us this parable to let us know that His grace, His Spirit, Christ dwells in that new heart which He has given in the new birth. Now, think of this one who is said to dwell in your heart if you're a believer. Turn with me for a moment to Colossians chapter 1, a few pages over. I mean, this is just incredible to think that Christ actually dwells in my heart, that he's given me a heart that's fit for him to be there. It's the heart he has given, that new heart, and he, by his Spirit, dwells in that heart. Now, beginning in verse 12 of Colossians 1, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, before we go on, you know what that means? That means right now I'm meet to be in heaven. I've got all that is needed for me to be in heaven. That's hard to get hold of, isn't it? The reason that I have all that's needed to be in heaven is because I have his righteousness and I've been given this new nature. And the difference between the saints in heaven and ones down here on earth is we still have these two natures, these, this old sinful nature. They have one nature, a holy nature. They put aside this sinful nature. But every believer right now is meet, is fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. I love that one line, more happy but not more secure are the glorified spirits in heaven. Every believer has all that's needed right now. Not what will be, I have it right now. Now, I only know that by faith. I can't look myself over and say, yep, I'm ready for heaven. No, no, I, I can't enter into anything that, but I believe I am because God's word says I am. Do you need anything else? I believe this because God's word says I am. Now, let's go on reading. Who hath, verse 13, who hath, it means it's already done. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ Jesus, He's all we'll ever see of God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. And that's how big he is. In him dwells all fullness. If you go on reading the next chapter, he says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And this is the one who is said to dwell in the heart of every believer. If you're somebody saved by the grace of God, he dwells in your heart right now. And he dwells in your heart as the Christ. I, I love it that he said that Christ may dwell in your hearts. And this talks about his offices as prophet, priest, and king. He dwells in your heart as God's prophet to teach you the gospel, to give you the word of God. Anything you truly learn, he gave to you. He dwells in your heart as the priest to represent you to the Father. At all times, he ever lives to make intercession for you. He has presented his sacrifice for you, and he stands before the Father as your representative. And he reigns in your heart as king. He's the king of kings. He controls everything, and he causes you to believe. You see, the king is the one whose will is done. You know the reason you believe? It's his will being done. The reason you see beauty in him? It's his will being done. He's king. Prophet, priest, and king dwelling in the heart. And this word dwell carries with it the idea of permanence. 
He's there forever. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's what he said. Now, I bet that somebody in this room, maybe everybody in this room, but somebody in this room is thinking, if he really was dwelling in me, it seems like I wouldn't struggle so much with sin. If he really was dwelling in me, I wouldn't have the struggle that I do with sin. You know, the opposite is true. The reason you have such a struggle with sin is because he's dwelling in you. That's why. You see, wherever he dwells, there's never peace with sin. It beats you black and blue. And the reason you struggle with sin is because he dwells in you. If he didn't dwell in you, you'd be okay. You'd be okay. You wouldn't have these struggles. Somebody else thinks, seems like if he was dwelling in me, people would see him more readily. They'd see Christ in me. I uh, have even heard somebody say, seems like if Christ, a little boy said, seems like if Christ dwelled in a man, he'd stick out some. And you could see him. Um, well, let me say this. I want to be Christ-like with everybody I deal with. I know I'm not, but I want to be. I, I, want to, I don't want, you know what I mean when I say that. I want people to, to not feel judged and threatened by me. And I judge people all the time. I realize that. I wish I could be delivered from that, not do it anymore. I'd love to never judge anybody again and be just like Christ. Uh, but I want you to think about this. Nobody saw Christ in Christ. What makes you think they'll see him in you? And if they do, they won't like him. He, he provokes such rage from people, uh, particularly religious people. Religious. So, so just these things, this thing, well, if Christ dwells in me, it seems like I wouldn't struggle with sin. No, the reason you do struggle with sin is because Christ dwells in your heart. You know, you read Romans chapter 7, that's the healthy state of a believer. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's, that's his experience. And this thing of, well, it seems like if Christ dwelled in my heart, others would see him in me. Uh, well, they did not see Christ in Christ. You know, he, he lived 30 years. Nobody got it. And this shows how little, little is not a, even a good word, how zero the natural man's understanding is of holiness. Because the one time holiness walked on this earth, nobody could see it. They didn't know. Now, the word I want to center on in this, back to our text in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. By faith. Now, this is so important that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen and the evidence that the Son of God, by His Spirit, dwells in a man's heart is faith. Believing the Gospel. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you look at the purity of your mind? Can you look at the cleanness of your actions and hands? Can you look in how well you're dealing with sin and how much you're growing and how holy you're becoming and think, yep, Christ dwells in my heart. I can see it. Now, if you said yes to that, you're in trouble. <laughs> You're in trouble. You haven't, you haven't ever learned anything about who you are. Um, the evidence that Jesus Christ the Lord, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, dwells in somebody's heart is faith in himself. That is the evidence. Now that lets us know of how important it is to understand 
what the Bible teaches regarding faith and to see if I really have this thing called saving faith. The faith of God's elect, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Because I cannot ascertain that Christ dwells in my heart by looking at my conduct and how, how I am and think, yep, I'm good to go. I believe he dwells in my heart. I'm doing so well. No, the evidence is faith. And the scripture says that faith is the evidence of things not seen. I can't look at myself and say, yep, Christ dwells in my heart. Look how good I am. We're just talking about the way you look at yourself. You know, you can see Christ in others if you're a believer. You really can. You can you, but, but if you're looking within your own heart and saying, yep, I see such goodness and holiness. That, no. The only evidence that you'll ever have that Christ dwells in your heart is faith in himself. Now, would you turn with me to Romans chapter 3? Because in these two chapters, Romans chapters 3 and 4, we have the clearest exposition in the New Testament as to what faith is. And if you want to know what faith is and whether or not you have it, listen real carefully to this passage of Scripture. Now in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Paul says, now we know. You know, he says that a lot. Somebody that's a believer, somebody who knows something, they know. They know. He, he said, this is not something we're guessing at. Now we know. Do you know this? Now we know. The we is speaking of all the elect of God. Every one of God's people knows this. We know. We've been convinced. We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, may become guilty before God. Now here's the starting point. Our state before God. That's where we got to begin. I'm not going to begin with your um, understanding of and belief in the existence of God. Everybody believes God is. Everybody already knows that. We've got to begin with our state before God. And what is that state? Guilty. Subject to the judgment of God. Subject to the condemnation of God is what he's talking about. Guilty as charged. If I'm ever going to have any understanding of saving faith, I'm going to have to take my place. Guilty as charged. Whatever God says against me is right. I agree with God. I take sides with God against myself. I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. Mouth stopped. No excuses. No self-justification. No self-vindication. Every mouth is stopped. Guilty before God. Is there anything we can do to make this better? Verse 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law. There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now the deeds of the law. Yes we can include the Ten Commandments. But the deeds of the law cover anything that you do. Any response you have that makes God able to do something for you. If you believe in free will, you believe in salvation by works. If you believe there's something you can do to make yourself holier, that's salvation by works. But what does he tell us? By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There's nothing we can do to change that state of guilt before God. Have you ever dealt with that? You're guilty. And there's not a thing you can do to change that. You're guilty. And there's nothing you can do to make yourself just before God. You're guilty and there's nothing you can do to put away your sin. There, you're guilty and there's nothing you can do to make yourself better. Guilty. No hope. If salvation has anything to do with something I need to do, I have no 
but, verse 21, but, now this is a glorious word in the scriptures, but, now, the righteousness of God without the law, without me doing something, is what that means. Now the righteousness of God without me doing anything. How does that sound to you? Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is what the Old Testament has always taught. This is the way Abel was saved. This is the way Noah was saved. This is the way Abraham was saved. This is the way David was saved. It's what the scriptures have always taught. People look in the Old Testament and think, well, that's a different God than the God of the New Testament. That's foolishness. Same God. Same God. And this is the only way any sinner has ever been saved. But now the righteousness of God without your obedience, some act, some doing on your part, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Now, here we have it. The righteousness of God. It's not talking about some kind of righteousness me or you work out. That's nothing but filthy rags. This is the very righteousness of God worked by the faithfulness, the obedience of Jesus Christ, His law keeping. The righteousness of God Without the law, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, doesn't say by faith in Jesus Christ, it says by faith of Jesus Christ, his faithfulness unto all and upon all them that believe. That's who has this righteousness, those that believe. Now look what he says at the latter part of verse 22. But there's no difference. You take the best, most moral, most kind, most generous human being that you know. And it's good to be that way. I'm not degrading that. But you take the best person you have ever known. And you take the most degraded, wicked, deceitful, heartless person you know. How much difference is there between those two people in God's eyes? None. There is no difference. Now somebody says, how can that be right? Because that person that is so good that you know is one of the people who wanted to murder Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to find out how you really are is by looking at the cross. When God left men to themselves, I don't care who they are. When God left men to themselves, this is you, this is me. When God left men to themselves and let them do what they wanted to do, what did they do? They nailed his son to a cross. Now that is my state. That is your state by nature. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely. By his grace, through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now here's the only hope any sinner has, that God justifies them freely by his grace through the redeeming work of Christ on the cross. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 whom God set forth. Now that word set forth, my marginal reading says foreordained. I love this. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is how complete his work is. It was accomplished before creation. Before there was ever a sinner, there was a savior. Christ is the lamb slain. God created the universe to send his son to accomplish salvation. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation, a sin removing sacrifice. And don't miss this phrase, through faith in his blood. Question, do you have faith in his blood? 
Do you believe that his blood is all that's needed to make you perfect before God? That do you believe that his blood actually put away sin? You don't believe his blood was some kind of attempt to make you savable if you do your part. You believe his blood is everything in your salvation. Faith, reliance in his blood. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past and the forbearance of God. That's so important. The gospel, we think, well, that, that declares his mercy and his grace and his love. <coughs> um, I won't deny that, but that's not the word Paul uses. It declares his righteousness. His righteousness. It's his righteousness. It, when God forgives my sin, he's doing the righteous thing because of the blood of his son. He's not just sweeping it under the carpet. He's demonstrating the righteousness of his character, how all sin's going to be punished. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Do you understand that? Do you understand that God has made a way to be just and be utterly righteous and holy, no inkling of sin or injustice or letting sin go under the rug and not dealing with it. Nothing like that. He's found a way to be just and the justifier of that one which believes in Jesus. Now we're going to get more into what this is a few verses down to, to believe in Jesus. But then he asked this question, where is boasting then? What can you say? Well, at least I did that. Well, somebody says, well, at least I received Christ. Not everybody received him. You're making a work out of receiving. That's foolishness. Where is boasting? What can you boast in and say, well, at least I did this that somebody else didn't do it? Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Now, I love this term, the law of faith. You know, every believer has a law in them that keeps them from looking anywhere but Christ alone. You can't do it. You've got this law in you. It's called the law of faith. And you cannot find any rest or assurance in anything but Christ himself. You've got this law. That's one of the laws of the new nature. And it is at work in you right now. You can't find comfort or assurance or rest in anything but Christ alone. Verse 28, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. There's no mixing faith and the law. It's faith without anything you do. Now, just may the Lord give us grace to just, it's, how many times have I thought to myself, I'm, it's going to be better from now on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start, stop doing that. It's going to be better from now on. And it, all that is, is anti-faith. Faith. Not the works of the law, but believing the gospel. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the... Gentiles, yes, Jews and Gentiles alike, seeing it's one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now understand this, the only way me or you can show any respect for God's holy law is by looking to Christ only. Somebody says, well, I, I try to keep the law. Yeah, but you didn't do it. You didn't do it. Well, I tried. That that, that don't cut mustard. That won't do you any good. Every believer, by faith in Christ, has kept God's holy law. I don't try to keep the law. I've kept it. Well, what's the evidence you have? Christ. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we then make 
Void the law through faith, God forbid we establish all of The only way you or I can honor God's holy law is by faith in Christ. That's it. That's it. Now, chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now, Abraham's the father of the faithful. I don't guess there's a more important human being other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the God-man, so obviously Abraham's nothing compared to him. But as far as men goes, there's not a more important man than Abraham for us to learn the gospel from. Now, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he'd have something to glory in. At least I did this. At least I received Christ. At least I accepted him as my personal Savior. At least I fill in the blank. At least I did anything. If that is the case, you'd have, or Abraham would have something they could glory in before God. You'd be like that um, Pharisee in the temple, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. I've done something. For if Abraham were just, for justified by works, he'd have something to glory in, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. God said something to him. See the stars? So shall your seed be. They're going to be that much. You know what Abraham did? With no evidence, at all, other than the word of God, he believed what God said. Now that's faith. With no evidence other than what God says, you believe what God says. That's what he did. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if there's anything that you do to make the difference, God owes you salvation. It's not a gift of his grace. It's him making payment for what is due you. But, and if you want to know what faith is, here it is. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, listen to this description of this man that believes in gospel. Number one, he works not. Now, why is it that he works not? Because he sees his works are no good. He wouldn't dare bring anything before God's presence because he knows it's defiled with sin. It's defiled with evil. It's not that he's lazy, although it's, it, it doesn't care anything about working. It's because he knows his works are no good. They won't, they can't be accepted. To him that worketh not. Have you ever worked not? Have you ever worked not? Well, you won't be saved if you don't. To him that worketh not, but believeth, relies, rests in, trusts him that justifieth the ungodly. Now, do you believe, are you relying on this, that by Christ's work on Calvary's tree, the ungodly will justify? Beloved, that's faith. You work not, but you believe on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean your faith is righteousness. The evidence that you are righteous is that you believe the gospel. Now, that is as... I don't know. Well, I can't make it plainer. That's the word of God. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. Now, who is that man that Christ dwells in their heart? The one who he dwells in their heart by faith. Now, I said this this morning. Let me remind you. Faith is not what you think about yourself. Well, I think I'm saved. 
That has nothing to do with faith. Well, what about that experience I had when I was a kid? That has nothing to do with faith. What about when I went down to the church and accepted Christ as my personal Savior? That doesn't have anything to do with faith. What about when I, whatever. If you're, if you're in the equation, that's not faith. Faith has wholly to do with what you believe concerning Him. Do you believe on Him who justifies the ungodly? That's the man who believes the gospel. Now, who is that man where Christ dwells in their heart? Now, we like to think, I would, I would like to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. More, I want to have more love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I want, I want to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be as the Beatitudes describes the true believer. I want to be poor in spirit. I want to mourn over my sin. I want to be meek before God. I want to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be pure in heart. I want to be merciful. I want to be persecuted for righteousness. Now, I want all those things. You do too. But can I look at something about me and think, Christ dwells in my heart? Because as soon as I start looking at those things, I thought, what, are they there at all? But here's something I can get hold of. I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You believe that? I believe he is the son of God. And that nothing is needed for my salvation but him. If you believe that, Christ, the infinite, eternal Christ, dwells in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, how we stand amazed that thy Son would dwell in our hearts, giving us a heart to believe your gospel. Lord, cause thy Son to dwell in our hearts by faith. Cause us to be of that number who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Bless this message for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Rich, come leave.